wie, wie ist es? Ja, okay. So, hello everybody. I'm here today to talk about your freedoms in the internet. And yeah, the title is the Free Software Foundation Europe's <coughs> Free Software Foundations Fighting for Your Freedom Since 1985. So, I, uh, okay, that was what already was expected. Okay, so sorry about that. Uh, now it should be better. So yeah, we talk about uh, your freedom today. And I will not be able to tell you about the old stuff from 1985 um, because I was not there yet with the uh, Free Software Foundations. But um, I joined the free software movement in 1999 and afterwards, in 2004, I joined the Free Software Foundation Europe and since then worked on a lot of the activities. So, um, there will be uh, a little bit more about the time afterwards. So, imagine you're a young programmer, talented, and you work together with a lot of other good programmers in a nice environment. You program something, you share this program with other hackers, you improve the software, you help others to improve the software, and um, you do all this stuff together. And then, after some time, there's a change. Some people start to say, no, you are not allowed to study the source code. I will not give that to you. You will just get a binary, you can run the program, then some people start to say, you are only allowed to run this program for this and this purpose. So you cannot do whatever you want, but they decide what you can do with it and what you cannot do with it. And they also say, no, we don't allow you to modify the software, to edit, uh, to change it so it fits your needs and you don't have to do something how the program wants it to do, but you can actually change it and modify it in a way that it does what you want to do. So, you were used to have all those freedoms and now people start to take them away from you. That was the start for uh, Richard Stallman in 1983 to decide that we have to change something here. We have to, to write software which again gives you those four freedoms to use, study, share and improve software. So, he started the GNU project for GNU is not Unix. The goal was to write a complete free operating system where each of these pieces of the operating system gives you the four freedoms to use, study, share and improve. A lot of people at the beginning said, you will not be able to do that, writing your own operating system, replacing all that stuff. He said, yeah, but I'll try and he started and after some time more and more people joined him. More, pe more people who are like-minded, who said it's important that you have these freedoms, that we control technology ourselves and not software controls us, that's important. So, yeah, he started the, uh, the GNU project. Two years later, he found the need to found a, um, an organization to, as a legal backbone for the GNU project at the beginning. That was when the Free Software Foundation in the US was, uh, was born. So, at the beginning, um, 
they started to mainly work on technical things. So they reprogrammed a lot of software to one piece by one uh, write a new operating system. And in the, 99, uh, in the 1990s, when Linus Torvalds wrote the Linux kernel, they actually had a complete free operating system, the GNU Linux uh, operating system. So every piece of that was free software and you were able to run an operating system on your computer which gives you those four freedoms. It was not as easy as it is today, so you cannot just insert a live CD, try it out and say install and everything works, but you were able to do that. Some time afterwards, it was also that they, they had to finish some technical things, but then more and more companies and more and more people started to program free software too. So there was not so much need anymore to concentrate on the technical things anymore. So that was when the free software foundations, at that time then, already in 2001, the free software foundation Europe was founded and afterwards the Free Software Foundation in India and Free Software Foundation Latin America. And they then concentrated more on political, legal and uh, social aspects of software. So they said, okay, we have the technical things, companies have commercial interests to write free software, there are a lot of programmers out there, we don't have to concentrate on that anymore. So until now what we have is, there, there are some high priority projects from the Free Software Foundation where they um, actually say in this part it's important to, to write free software where we want to, to pay someone to write it. And um, also we at Free Software Foundation Europe in some uh, areas we help technical development in some areas to um, where we think it's very important like we supported the, uh, the AC uh, search engine with press work and so but what we do no, now more is um, to concentrate on the political aspects, the social aspects, the legal aspects of software. Why do we do this? We want that free software hackers can write code and they don't have to deal with all that legal stuff which is boring for most of the hackers, not for Martin, who's a lawyer, but yeah. Um, and also about all the other things like dealing with politicians and all this. So what we do is for example we support free software hackers legally. So when a free software hacker has a problem like he wants to write uh, software, wants to combine software, there are free software licenses, there's, there are questions how you can combine them or what you have to do to, to uh, publish something as free software or um, also if there are companies who want to, to um, publish something as free software or, or have um, when, when developers have questions about trademarks, like some, sometimes a free software hacker comes to us and say, yeah, we are now sued because someone says they have a trademark for our program name and uh, then we get them in contact with lawyers and help them out with that and uh, yeah or we also um, the Free Software Foundation um, is writing the GNU GPL, the GNU LGPL and the GNU um, LGPL those are three free software licenses so you don't have to write your own license you should never write your own license that's really if you are not a lawyer you should not do that but we provided uh, the Free Software Foundations provide um, free software licenses which are checked, which are proven in court, so you don't have to deal with that. And um, what we also do in this area, in the legal area, is that we also make sure that free software licenses, um, um, that companies comply with free software licenses. So when you are a free software hacker and you write free software, and afterwards someone else takes free software, puts it in his product, but then uh, he doesn't comply with the license terms, so he doesn't say to anybody, this is free software, he doesn't give them the opportunity to get the source code, then we jump in and help uh, to solve this problem. Most of the times we solve this problem out of court, we have a legal network where we educate companies how to comply with licenses, but sometimes we also do it uh, in court. And uh, what we recently started is also that we buy devices and check them for GPL violations, for example. So, another thing what we did in this area. 
when you are a programmer, software patents are bad for you. Because you start writing a program and it's covered under copyright. And everything is okay because now nobody else can just copy the program. But you wrote this program and then someone else comes and says, you are violating my patent. Now you have a problem. So someone registered something, an idea, not an implementation. This is covered by copyright, but just the idea how something could work. And then you are not allowed to implement this idea anymore. So it's like, um, think about you wrote a book and then someone says and said, oh, in this scene, um, this, this man is killing the, his wife in the bathroom with a knife. And I have patented this idea, so you are not allowed to use this in this book. Um, before, software was just under copyright. And then some people started to introduce patents on that. When someone introduces new monopolies into an area, like you give out a monopoly, that uh, someone cannot use this idea anymore. Then you have to prove to society that this is a good thing. And you cannot just say, um, okay, we introduced this without proving it, that this is a good thing. So we have already a monopoly, which is copyright, and then you introduce a new one, which is patents. So what we did here is, we worked um, to prevent software patents. There is the, uh, um, uh, the website of the FSFE about software patents and also the end software patents website where we gathered all the information. A lot of organizations worked on that like the FFII or uh, April in, in France and others. So yeah, with software patents that's also one, one example um, why I urge you not to use the term intellectual property. This is just a side issue, but it's, it's stupid. It doesn't help anything. Like, think about the example we had before. I program something, it's covered under copyright. I am allowed by copyright to sell this program. Now someone else comes and says, hey, I have a patent on this. You never heard about that before. But now, your right from copyright is taken away by patents. So what does, for example, the phrase means, we need more intellectual property? What does it mean? More patents? More copyright? Uh, what, so what, what you should do here when you talk about these issues, please say, I, I want to have stronger copyright protections, I want to have uh, patents on software, I want to have better trademarks, or whatever. But don't use this term. Okay, so also connected with this, we found out that a lot of laws, they are not done on a national basis. Like software patents, they are not introduced in Germany. They are discussed in the European level. And for this one, it's already discussed in the U United Nations agencies. They, they have treaties like the TRIPS agreement and other agreements to regulate such things like how should copyright uh, be done, how should patents be done. So that was um, the uh, start that we also um, got involved in, uh, in the um, WIPO, for example, the World Intellectual Property Organization. We became an observer of this organization. It's a United Nations organization. So we participate in the discussions there, can read the documents. And um, we had a petition uh, to transform the World Intellectual Property Organization into a World Intellectual Wealth Organization. Because we say it's not about property. Our goal is not that someone has a lot of property, but what we want in this world is that we have wealth, that we can exchange ideas and all this. So we worked on copyright issues, patent issues, trademark issues on the United Nations level. Um, with the United Nations level, you also realize that some stuff is discussed there and only 10 years later or so, this boils down to the German level, for example, and these uh, laws have to be implemented there. So it's a very, very long-term activity which we did there. This case 
was also one of the longest cases we ever had. It started before I joined FSFE, I think in 2001 already, that the European uh, Commission found Microsoft guilty um, uh, to use its monopoly in the desktop market to also get a monopoly in the um, uh, group, work group server market. So they kept um, protocols secret so others could not implement them. And so the servers from other people could not talk with um, Windows desktop clients. So they found them guilty and put a fine on Microsoft so that they had to pay. Um, at that time it was uh, 300,000 something uh, euro. So what Microsoft did in this case was they went to the judge. They went to the European uh, um, Court of Justice. Um, and during this court um, uh, case, FSFE was a third party on site of the European Commission and helped to answer all the questions from the European Commission. So the European, uh, no, the, from the European Court of Justice. So the European Court of Justice asked questions and we helped the European Commission to answer them because there was a lot of technical things involved. We got the Samba people in there and they explained technical things in words which can be understood by, um, by the judges. So in the end, actually three months ago now in this year, this decision was now confirmed. And it was now confirmed that Microsoft had to pay 860 million euro um, because they were found guilty of that. And more important, because the money was, that was never the problem, because the, the main problem was we needed the interoperability information for Microsoft so that other people, free software programmers, can write competing software. So in the end, Microsoft now also had to, um, to give this interoperability information and now free software companies can implement them and we can have competing products there. But this is also something you see, it's a court case which years and years and years and you need funding and everything to, to work on that. One other thing which we worked on is um, open standards. What we achieved until now is that nobody will say open standards are a bad thing. I'm against open standards. When nowadays a politician or someone else says open standards are a bad thing, nobody will take him serious anymore. So that's a long thing we achieved there. It took us years to get this, um, get this through and uh, talk with politicians about this case, um, about open standards, uh, talk with uh, people in companies about that. We talked with people in the industry about open standards and found a definition what's, what's important for an open standard. How can you make software interoperable so that all software, uh, competing software vendors, um, they can compete, but you, do, you as a consumer, you don't have to use the same product to exchange files or to use the same protocol or whatever. So, yeah, that was a long, uh, long, long way to, get, uh, to come to this point. But nowadays, a lot of governments, they use the definition we developed there. Um, it's in a lot of documents from the European Commission, uh, from, from German government. So the, the definitions are um, more and more going into the direction where we uh, develop them. And uh, la um, this year at, uh, at Document Freedom Day, uh, Stephen Fry also gave us a quote. It's a bit longer. You can, you can read it on documentfreedom.org. Um, so yeah, as I said, nowadays it's, it's common that open standards are a good thing. So free software programmers can compete against non-free software programmers because you have the open standards there when they are uh, implemented. Um, okay, we handcuffed this person. Um, also, he had a lot of bodyguards. Um, we sent him handcuffs. Why did we do that? Um, this year we again had Document Freedom Day, which is a day, an uh, international day, to um, foster, um, to educate more people why open standards are important. And so this year we asked people to send us suggestions who needs education about open standards. And we send them a package with information material, what is an open standard, why is this important, and 
to show that with, without open standards you are dependent, we attach some handcuffs. And uh, here you see uh, Nili Cruz, uh, Vice President of the European Commission. She will also be here, I think, the days. And um, showing our handcuffs, which I sent to her. And um, yeah, she says she's on our side and she's uh, in favor of open standards, of course, because everybody is in favor of open standards. And yeah, so that's what we did there. We handcuffed w over 100 people this year. Um, but we don't just do stuff with handcuffs and open standards. We, um, in uh, 2010, uh, on Document Freedom Day, we um, were here with the, with the Berlin group. We um, gave a prize to the German uh, Deutschland Radio um, because they are providing their files, uh, their, their live streams in Og Vorbis, which is an open standard on their website. So you don't have to install like a uh, flash player or um, uh, MP3, download MP3s to, to listen to the live stream, but you can use free software to do that. So that's what we do here in, in Berlin with the group. Um, later in the year, um, one year later, we also gave it to Tagesschau because they are providing their videos in an open standard, the Octheora standard. Those are just some examples from Berlin now. Um, the Document Freedom Day um, was celebrated worldwide. There were over uh, 40, uh, 53 events, 54 events worldwide. A lot of things like uh, they gave away prizes, they, they did some cool activities on the streets and yeah, so those are activities where when you want to, to prote protect your freedom, when you want to help people understand open standards, you can participate there next year on March 27th, the last Wednesday in March. Um, okay, so now we come to, in my view, one of the biggest lies in the internet. I might have to fight uh, about that with Hugo Roy, who had the uh, uh, talk about the TOS minus DR uh, with the terms of service, which people don't read. But um, yeah, I will tell you about my lie here and uh, how the, the fellowship groups and uh, FSFE volunteers solving are, are solving that. This is one of the biggest lies in the internet. I'm not talking about the ministry there from Brazil. I'm talking about this uh, note at the bottom that uh, in order to open PDF files, you must have Adobe Acrobat Reader installed. If you don't have Acrobat e Reader, click to the image below to download. You don't need Acrobat Reader to open PDFs. There are a lot of free software PDF readers out there. And to prove that, we created a website it's called pdfreaders.org, where we listed free software PDF readers. And we provided that on this website, so when people search for free software PDF readers, they find that. And we also translated this website into 26 languages until now. What we did afterwards was, this website with the commercial for Adobe, I mean, there is there's a, a button of a company on the website of a ministry. That's commercial. That's commercial. Here, uh, like when you put a sign on a highway to ride on this road, you need a Mercedes. You can make a greatest test drive on your Mercedes dealer around the corner. Your government. I mean, what would BMW say about that? Or if we go to France, what would they say about advertising a German company and not a French one? So what we thought about is we contact public organizations, um, the uh, civil uh, ministries and public governments about this. And we first asked all the people to participate in a bug hunt. So people could send us um, websites where this advertisement is done. We received uh, over uh, yeah, 2,103 uh, websites in the uh, worldwide, most of them in Europe. And then we sent them letters to all of them. And until now, what we have is a 26% success rate. So 547 pages, they either removed this advertisement or they also said that on pdfreaders.org, you can also download free software PDF readers to do this. 
We um, also had a petition, which you still can sign. Um, it's uh, found on this link there. Um, and um, this campaign also had huge impact in the, uh, with governments. So, for example, there was an official questioning in the uh, European uh, Parliament about this, where they asked where the European uh, Parliament is to, uh, or European um, bodies are doing this advertisement and why they are doing this. In the, um, in the German Parliament, also the, the Green Party made an official question with over 18 questions about this. And, um, and now also in, the, in a new uh, document from the German government, the, it's called a Migration Guide, they suggest to um, uh, public websites to um, use uh, the texts we provided to, uh, so they don't make advertisement. And um, yeah, so we, we did a lot of stuff there. Just to show you one very nice example from Germany. Um, this is a website of uh, the city of Hamburg. And what they write there is, um, um, please decide for a free PDF viewer. There are many programs to read PDFs. Um, the following list of PDF readers is uh, vendor neutral. All of these programs are free software, uh, which uh, respect your freedoms to use, study, share, and improve. Um, this gives you control over your computer and helps you to protect your privacy. And um, that's a very nice thing. And I think the best thing is um, it's under this URL you find it, under uh, hamburg.de slash adobe. So yeah, that was one of the campaigns there. Um, we also had one yeah, less successful project. We uh, produced an analog printer which you can order there, but yeah, we found out that hardware manufacturing and home hardware design and all this is not the, the main area of FSFE, so we concentrate on, on free software, but if you want, you can order one of them. One, um, one other area where we are involved is um, education. So we believe that it's very, very important that people can understand their environment. We have computers everywhere. And we want people to understand what those computers are doing. We don't, force, we, we don't want to force people to understand what they are doing. But we want them to have an understanding of the general principles. And we want them, if they, they want to do so, to fully, completely understand the technology. And so that um, children in schools don't answer something like, yeah, and milk is coming from the supermarket, um, or yeah, software is coming from the internet. In future, we are, um, we are helping uh, to, to educate children about um, software in school. So we had these uh, small workshops with robots where we help them uh, learning programming. And I mean, there are a lot of people out there who do this, and this is, this is very important to teach programming. And, so that, that already pupils in school, they learn that it's a good thing to, to, um, to interact with others, that software actually is something people can change. It's not something you get and you have to eat it how it is, but it's something you can change and it's something which you can understand after some time. And it's something which when you talk with others about it and exchange ideas, you become better in understanding technology and you become better in, uh, in improving stuff and doing things which is good for you. So with our education team, we are working to bring more free software and more of this knowledge into schools, universities. So if you are interested in helping with this, very much appreciated. Very important thing so that people who come out of school are not like, yeah, uh, I use my computer to surf the internet but I don't know what it does or whatever. So, yeah, that's one of our goals there. The, uh, one of the other topics where we worked heavily on now um, in, the, in the recent month was uh, um, about uh, general purpose computing. So um, I had this talk already on, on uh, Wednesday about that. More, there were more and more developments that the freedoms we had at the beginning with a computer so that we could change everything on it, that we can do whatever we want to do with it, that we can change software with others, that we can decide on our own if we want what we can do on these computers and what not. 
um, that those freedoms are taken away from us. So one first thing was it, what I explained before with non-free software. So they just give you program code and say, no, you cannot learn how it works. No, we say in the license terms, you can only do this, 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 and this with it. And no, you're not allowed to share it with others. And no, it's just us who can change it. You are not allowed to modify it, so it does what you want. We are the only ones. We decide who can change it and who not. Then the other thing was with DRM that they start to take away um, control over your computer, that they introduce programs on, on, on your computer which took away the control just to, um, to, yeah, that was justified with the, with from the music and the, um, the film industry to, uh, because they said, yeah, people can illegally copy music or, or movies on a computer. So we have to make the computers in a way that they are not able to do this. So they introduced this DRM systems and took away the freedom from you. And recently, what's a big threat for free software is Secure Boot, which, uh, which makes it difficult for you or e for most of us perhaps impossible to install free software on machines or other operating systems on machines because they restrict what will boot after you turn on your computer, which uh, software can be booted and which cannot be booted. So our goal is not that everybody sits down and reprograms each devices. Our goal is not that uh, people can uh, do illegal things with computers. But we don't want that technology rules, that someone who controls technology can say what you can do and what you cannot do. This should not happen. You can do a lot of stupid things with technology. But in, in, the, in the talk on Wednesday, there was this question, yeah, what should we do with uh, the tools in a kitchen? You can do a lot of stupid things. I mean, let's start with the knife. You can do a lot of stu stupid things with a knife. But what do you want to do? Do you want to, make, to design them in a way that you cannot do these stupid things anymore? You will not be able to do this. Because if you design technology in a way that you try to prevent stupid things, you will always also prevent thousands of things which are perfectly, which are, which are good things, which are innovative, where the vendor didn't think about it, but you or, or you or someone else here in the audience has a perfect um, idea what he can do with that. But we prevent some, uh, we prevent people from doing useful things with technology just because we try to prevent people from doing uh, from copying uh, movies illegally, from copying music illegally, or um, illegally um, copy uh, ebooks. So that's something uh, which is absolutely not good for, for us if we do go this way to control people with the technology. So um, if you want to, uh, to get involved there, you can read what's the current state of that. Um, there's also the Defective by Design campaign, where uh, the FSF um, lists um, um, products which does not contain this digital restriction management. So, yeah, get involved there. I also have, at the end, a very few, uh, small amount of stickers about this. So, yeah. Um, the other campaign which we recently started, also connected with general purpose computing, is um, our Free Your Android campaign. Um, Torsten Krote will give a talk about that on Saturday. So I will not give you all the details. The idea is that we want to help people to have free software on their phones. And with, uh, with a plain Android, you have a lot of free software on the phones. There's still some non-free software on it. But you have the basis. You have a lot of free software on it. But um, often when you buy a device, they already modified that um, Android, and then it's a crippled one, where you have a lot of programs which you cannot deinstall, there is non-free software on it, um, uh, programs are running and you cannot close them, uh, there is commercial on it, and you do not control what's happening with your data on this device. You walk around with a small computer, it contains your calendar, your address book, um, your emails perhaps, um, the, the text message of your girlfriend or whatever. And you don't know what's happening on these devices. 
and not only no, you don't know it, nobody else but the manufacturer can find it out or it's very, very difficult for others to find it out. So we want to make sure that more people know what's going on on, on phones. And with the Free Your Android campaign, we are trying to do that. We want to organize workshops to help people to free their phones, to add again the free software version on the, on the phone. So like in the old days with the GNU Linux installation parties where you help people to install free software on their phones, we want to do the same thing with, the, uh, with Android phones. So you can uh, listen to the talk tomorrow. Very nice campaign. Um, I can only tell you, um, out of 10 people who have free quests at the moment, eight people ask us about this campaign. So I think it's not that bad. Okay, one other thing. Um, when you go, uh, went to politicians in the past and said, hello, I want to talk with you about free software. He looked at you and he said, or no, he didn't say it, but he, he thought, what a freak. Long hair uh, with his computer, freak. And yeah, that was it. Then uh, afterwards, someone else came and said, hello, I would like to talk with you about free software and why free software is important for society. Um, and he thought, freak. What, what a freak. <laughs> Technology, politics, that doesn't work together. Okay. But then, after some time, there was perhaps the third person coming to this guy and said, yeah, hello, I want to talk with you about free software. And he thought, damn, three freaks. But afterwards, he said to his staff, please go and find out what these people are talking about. And something like this happened in some places. And of course, there were also politicians who understood it by their own. And it didn't take three times. But for those where it takes longer, we want you to help us with this process. And even if you are the one where he thinks, freak. So um, what we did is we started uh, with, our free, um, with our Ask a Candidates campaign, where we provide information how you can contact politicians about that, about free software. Or, I mean, you could also use that to, to talk with them about other issues which are important to you. So, don't just talk with them about free software. You can also talk with them about why it's important to have net neutrality or privacy or whatever. Whatever you think is important, talk with them about that. It's not that they won't listen at all to you. So um, we provided some questions which you could ask politicians about free software. We also um, asked um, official questions to um, during elections as uh, FSFE to them and um, the parties then replied and we analyzed the, the answers and uh, we did that in several federal state elections in Germany, we also did it in uh, Austria and in Switzerland till now. But the main goal of this is that you go out and talk with politicians about free software. That you get some examples and you sit down with like for example Recently, only a few months ago, there was someone and he sent these questions to, um, to candidates for the mayor in a city here in Germany. So take these questions as an example and talk with politicians about why you think this is important. If you don't explain it to them, they will not understand it. So yeah, jo join this up, um, join this activity, talk with people about that. When you don't talk with them about that, they won't understand it. Um, with all these activities, with talking with politicians and um, doing all this political work, we also had some success there. So um, it was not just talking with them, talking with them, talking with them, but some of them also more and more realized, hey, this is a good thing. So um, for example, we uh, received uh, um, a medal here in Germany from a political organization which does nothing at all with technology. We received this medal because we are doing good things for society. It was a Theodor Heuss medal from, a, um, uh, uh, for, from the first president of, uh, of Germany, um, which uh, goes out there. And um, so it's realized that free software is something which is good for society. And it's not something about technology alone. It's something about uh, the, the distribution of the power, who controls whom and all this and uh, about sharing and 
all these values and that is something which is political. And um, yeah, the other thing we got in the same year was uh, our uh, first president. Um, he got the uh, the Cross of Merit uh, from the um, from the German government, uh, Bundesverdienstkreuz, which is uh, comparable to the knighthood in the um, in Britain. So. Um, if you join and you start and you ask politicians about free software and you get involved there, perhaps you once became a knight. I mean, which boy didn't dream about that? Or girl? <laughs> um, yeah. So, in, uh, in the work for free software, those were just some examples. There are a lot of more activities and it's not just the free software foundations doing activities for free software there are also a lot of um, local free software organizations which, which do a lot and a very good job to promote free software and um, there are also local groups everywhere and if you want control over the devices in the future or even if you like I myself, I don't want to program devices, but I want others to be able to do that. I want others to look at this stuff and to innovate with that and to play around with that so that I get good software without being dependent on one or two or three companies. So if this is important to you, you have to start and talk with people about these issues. You have to start to, to get involved in that and everybody here can help a little bit with that. And if it's even like subscribing uh, to um, our monthly updates. So once a month you uh, receive an email from me where I write about what I think is most important uh, in uh, happened uh, in, in free software in Europe. And you read that and you think, oh yeah, that's important. You forward that to some friends so they learn about that. Or um, you join some discussions about that. You, uh, you join local groups, meet with others and there are a lot of things what you can do. There's um, on, uh, on our website under contribute, you find a lot of ways and for everybody here, there is, there is one thing what you can do. Just to show you uh, some people here. So when you are interested to do something, Peter, please stand up. Uh, Peter is from Austria, from Vienna. He's there in our local group. So if you have questions what you can do, you can ask him. He's doing stuff in the audio, um, in the audio sector. There is uh, Eric here. Um, he's in Berlin, so if you have questions about that, he's also involved in the um, Android campaign. There's Martin, who did an awful job for um, Slovakia um, and is in, in involved in legal things. So if you are involved in legal things of free software, you can talk with him how to get active. Um, there is Anna here. She joined us recently, but you can talk with her about how it feels when you get started. Or if you want to program, um, there are people like here, um, Michael Christensen, who is developing a free software a search engine, which is distributed, so we have free knowledge. So there are many, many people here with whom you can talk what you can do. And I ask you, please do it. So we still have control over our computers, and it's not others who control us in future. So um, thanks a lot, and uh, I am happy to receive some questions. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my question is, uh, what can be done uh, from your point of view um, to uh, make Linux more uh, widespread in the desktop environment, like for desktop uh, computers, just average user? So one of the things which should be done to get uh, Linux or other free operating systems more widespread on a desktop uh, field is people have to be able to buy them. It's, it's a hassle to buy hardware and then install other software on it. So people should have the opportunity, the possibility to buy hardware with that. Or at least when they buy hardware, that they don't have to pay money to a company which operating system afterwards they don't use. Like at the moment, it's very, very difficult to get a laptop without Microsoft Windows installed or without Apple operating system installed. So this is something where um, maybe by law or uh, some other ways, you have to change that, that it's not bundled in that way. So that people can do, um, deliver 
um, competing computers with a free operating system. If the uh, vendors, they over the time have to pay this Windows tax, they cannot, um, they cannot uh, um, offer another operating system on them because they cannot compete from the price. So this is one very important thing. The, the other thing is um, dependencies with standards. Like um, I already uh, told about that with the uh, Open Standards uh, and the Document Freedom Day. When you nowadays switch your desktop, you don't just switch the operating system. There are also a lot of uh, programs involved like, um, like a, a word processor. And people continue to send you text documents. And when you are not able to open those text documents, you will be the guy who is doing bad stuff. Because, yeah, I sent you this document, you cannot open it, you with your crappy computer, all oh, this free software stuff, it doesn't work. So, when we don't have open standards, you will always have this problem. And you will always be the one who has the problem. Because all the others say, yeah, we don't have this problem. We use what everybody else uses. And there are also a lot of other um, dependencies there where, yeah, one of the main things is open standards, and the other thing is unbundling of uh, hardware and software in the, uh, at least for PCs and laptops. The other thing is, I think the, the desktop market is, um, is not, it, it's one market, yes, but there are also a lot of other markets like the, um, the phones, the tablets, where it's also much, much important, uh, more, um, more and more important to get free software on them. That's why we, at the moment, concentrate a lot on the, on the free or Android campaign, because there are not a lot of dependencies there. So that's a good thing to, to spread free software in this area first. Other questions? So what's the freest smartphone on the market at the moment? Yeah, the freest smartphone in the market. That's a difficult question. Um, I mean, there were smartphones or... Actually, I don't want to call them smartphones because most of them are not smart at all. They are very dumb because you cannot control them and whatever. But um, there are um, computers with whom you can make phone calls and access the internet, um, which you can still get, which are very friendly for free software. Like, there was uh, the Open Moco, which was an old phone uh, which you could try programming on, but it didn't actually work that much as a phone. It's, it's really difficult. I know some people who use it as a phone, but it's difficult to actually use it as a day-by-day -day phone. There were also some initiatives like from Nokia. They had very good phones with free software on them, like the N900. There was a complete uh, GNU Linux operating system under there, but they now uh, switched and now use um, uh, Microsoft uh, uh, Windows operating system on their new phones. So, at the moment, um, it's, it's very difficult. That's why we started the Free Your Android campaign. So, there are some devices where you can install Replicant. That's a free operating system, also based on Android. Um, but I think at the moment you cannot buy a new phone which is supported by this. So with the Free Your Android campaign, we um, concentrate a lot on uh, Cyanogen mod, which is a free version of the Android where you don't need, for example, a Google account and all this stuff to install software. So you should check the uh, Replicant uh, website and see which of the devices are supported. That's how I did it, for example, too. So we check the, the website, check which uh, device is supported, then you buy one of them because then you are on the safe side that you can flash it with another software. Unfortunately, you still have to do this, this flashing. And they will warn you, yeah, you lose warranty and everything to get your freedom. Uh, we will make it very, very complicated for you. But yeah, that's why we started that again, to help you to, to do this. Um, you cannot buy, a, at least not to my knowledge, a really free phone at the moment. Uh, one thing, Replicant is the one which uh, does not include uh, uh, non-free software at all, and, um, but that's, you, you will not find new devices which are supported by that. The other one is Cyanogen mod. But you can find all this information on freeyouranddroid.org. There are also a lot of leaflets in the, here because uh, we thought about these questions. Further questions?
And uh, before I forget that, because he was late, this is uh, Hugo Rhin, who is also active in free software. He's from Paris. So if you have questions about free software in France and uh, uh, other things uh, around this, you can also talk with Hugo how to get involved and defend your freedom. Oh, OK. Just because I have no good way of asking this, I'm asking a semi-legal question here. Um, other, other where I have no good way of asking. Um, why do I, or is it really legal that I lose my warranty if I install software on a device? Um, I mean, I'm not. Re if the device breaks out of hardware reasons, like my button's not working anymore, isn't that covered by the warranty anyway? Because I have exactly that problem with my HTC right now. So um, yes, what. Uh when you flash your hardware with a uh, free operating system, the vendor will say, yeah, you lose the warranty. And also, for example, it's just a keyboard where one thing falls out. They say, yeah, that's because you flashed it, which is, in my view, completely nonsense. And uh, the problem is that at the moment, um, all we, what, what we said is, we will flash it. And when someone has a case like that, we will try we will, hello, hello, okay, um, what we will do then is we will, if necessary, do it on the legal part that we um, go to court and try to get that through. So if you would be interested to be such a, a person, just come to me afterwards and we can talk about that. Um, if it's possible to somehow do this, we have to talk with our lawyers. In our legal network, we have a lot of them and so, yeah, I... I, don't, I cannot promise anything that we, we actually can do this, but I will talk with our lawyers if we can, uh, if we can uh, go there and, and do something about it. Because I think it's an important thing that when you use free software on it, you, you cannot buy a, a, device, a computer with, uh, without uh, non-free software uh, as a phone. And when you do that, um, that you flash it, and then they say, yeah, this hardware stuff, also you will lose warranty for that. That's not right, and uh, we, will, we will work to, to solve this, I hope. Okay. Um, what do you think, what is the reason why there is no phone on the market which is really free and really with free Android or free software on it? I mean, is it because there is no market for it or is it, I mean, if there is really a lot of people who are, yeah. That's because uh, you can make much more money if you can restrict your users. If, uh, if you can get the data from your users, you can sell this data. So that's a form of income. If you um, can restrict them what they can do with the, with the software and what they cannot do with the software, you can make money out of that. Because, for example, on some devices, you can say, yeah, but you are only allowed to play this, this music here one time and you're not able to, to, uh, to download, for example, the ringtones to another device. Um, and with all this, there are business models uh, involved with that. Like when you, when you buy an Android phone, Google wants to make money with your data afterwards. The Google accounts are, are uh, all in there. When you buy an iPhone, Google, um, Apple wants to make money with a lot of stuff and they won't, don't want you to remove that. When you get a, a smartphone, uh, one of these telephones, and for example, there's, you, you can make um, agreements with, uh, with other people to, um, we will insert your software on this device. And when, you, when we insert this uh, as a commercial for you, um, we will get that money. So you get money for, for inserting crappy software on devices which people cannot remove. It happened to me on, on my phone, which I bought. There was an UEFI, UEFA application on there. There was a Facebook application on there, which you were not able to remove. You can make money with that. They, some people will pay you to insert commercials in your products. So then you can better compete because it's a lower price than the competing one. People will buy that because a lot of people don't think about these issues before. They don't think about, oh, yeah, instead of just, yeah, I want to play around and the device should uh, look nice. They don't think about uh, their, their privacy for these devices and their con the control of that. So the more and more people who start thinking about this issue and also vote with their money uh, about that, the more people will, will go this way. 
It was the same with the, with the CDs, with digital restriction management. They added copyright protection to the CDs. They tried to sell that. People said, no, we don't want to have this crap. After some years of trying and trying harder and trying harder and even installing malware on your computer with, when you bought a CD, like with the Sony rootkit, they, in the end, um, had to f stop that because people said, yeah, go away, we won't pay for that. Then we download the stuff illegally somewhere or do whatever. And the same thing we have to do with, with software. We should not pay for non-free software. We should not pay for devices which are restricted, which are completely broken by design. We should pay money for companies which um, respect our freedom. So that's the, the main thing there. I think. Do we still have question for one question? Uh, I just wanted to ask, I, I joined it a little bit late, but did you discourage like NVIDIA and AT, ATI, so like devices that are closed, also on the mobile, uh, in the mobile sector, all the drivers we have to use are also closed? Um, like, uh, first, is there actually on the mobile, is there any open for the wire, wireless, um, is there any open hardware? And for the uh, laptops, like what can we actually use? Is it just Intel? Intel is, is, is open, right? Uh, not really. So, uh, no, I haven't discussed, uh, discussed uh, these topics about uh, um, uh, all this, which graphic cards you can buy and or open hardware in this. Perhaps briefly, when I talked about the analog printer, that we are not so much involved in the open hardware stuff, you find uh, some information about... Um, uh, things like that also with buyers and everything on fsf.org under the high priority projects. Um, beside that, um, yeah, I think it will take too long now to, to answer that. If, if you buy hardware and you want to run free software on it, it's always good if you um, search before, like using YAC or Seeks, <laughs> to find a solution what hardware you can buy. Um, it's it's very difficult in, in a lot of uh, at a lot of times. Like I said, it's a lot of people they don't um, send uh, they don't uh, sell it with free software, so you have to add it yourself. Then you don't get free software drivers for that. That's a huge problem. But um, yeah, the solution to that is is difficult because we have to force people to to sell us the free software, so we don't have to run behind them and always reprogram stuff like we did until now. Okay, then uh, thanks a lot, and I am still here to answer questions. There will be some stickers here, uh, and um, all the other people here which I introduced you, they can answer questions about free software. Thanks.